Where is InsureTech headed next? This is where indie agents own the answer. Welcome to the Vertifor Insurance Podcast. Let's go. Welcome back to another episode of the Vertifor Insurance Podcast. Man, I am so excited to get started with this episode. We have a previously pro soccer player turned COO of a innovative insurance agency, Tom Parrott on the line. Welcome, sir. How are you? Great. Thank you. And that is way more of a uh, introduction than I deserve, that's for sure. I, I appreciate the humility. Uh, I think once people hear your story, they'll definitely, uh, they'll probably feel the same way that I do. I, I have a lot of respect for your journey. Um, take me back a little bit to pre-insurance Tom. What, how did you, 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 you and I had talked a little bit about, you know, how you had uh, dipped into the soccer world and, and kind of dipped out of that. What was that journey like? Had you did you always know you wanted to be a soccer player? What what position did you play? I feel like I could ask a million questions. Have you met Megan Rapino? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Um, so I mean, I feel like a lot of you know players start from the the whole family thing. My dad actually played for Crystal Palace and Charlton when he was younger. And uh, I was born in Scotland originally, and they ended up moving over to the States uh, to go to university. And my dad had a youth soccer club that he ran. So I was actually, I actually grew up playing in Iowa of all places, which is really completely random. Yeah. So I was there until I was 15 and then okay. moved back to Britain to play. I was at Birmingham City um, and was there when we got promoted to the Premier League. Um, and then and that was like on on youth levels so basically a scholarship and then after that i moved up north to scotland and played for a few clubs in scotland and then 2011 uh, made my way back to the states because i knew i always wanted to to eventually settle down here and found this little gem of a place called wilmington north carolina where there's a usl team mm. and i played there for six years until uh unfortunately wilmington folded but that was kind of the um, catalyst for trying to find something new. I knew I was, I knew I was going to retire, and I was coaching a youth team in Wilmington at the same time, and actually was coaching our agency owner's son, which is kind of how I fell into oh this. And one day I just asked him. I was like, "Hey, you know what I'm like. You know my skill set. Do you think there's anything in your organization that you know that I can help with?" He said. Oh yeah, man! Come on in, get your license, see how it goes. And that was six and a half years ago, wow. and uh, been loving it ever since. That's fantastic. So, what was the life of a? I mean, let's just put it this way: not everybody has the chance to pursue a sport at that level, even if they want to. Uh, I, I mean, I think you have to have a mix of of things, right? A little talent, uh, a little bit of luck, uh, networking. Um, you know the the athletic capacity um, and and a track record to some extent, right? So, you, you know, you you must have had a pretty good mix of those things, and now you're catapulted into this incredible uh, like level of of athleticism. Like, what what was the daily life of Tom like back then? What were some of the things that you had to develop in internally, you know, as a person that taught you to be who you are today? Well, you're testing me because it was so long ago. It's gonna be gonna be <laughs> okay. tough to remember. But. You don't you don't look that old. Stop. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I think the biggest thing because of the age at the time, because I was 15 when I moved back, mm -hmm. it was the you're pretty much independent that young, and that mm -hmm. was that was that was tough because you're going from you know your friend group and going over into a, a an unknown world. But luckily, I had a, a really good um, host family, and I think that was huge. So I'm always interested in you know kids and stuff here that go on these you know trips to Europe to do schooling for a semester or whatever it is. That was massive. Mm -hmm. um, but then when it got to the day to day, I mean, it was just it was just making sure that you grind and try and be the best possible version of yourself that you can be. 
but going from a, a sort of like a big fish in a small pond scenario to, oh my goodness, absolutely everybody yeah. is better than you are. Yeah. How do you then get to that next level? That, mm-hmm. that was always a really uh, fun challenge and, and interesting challenge. And and just the, the day-to-day life, I was able to do things that, that travel, you know, go into different countries for pre-seasons or tournaments or, you know, traveling Europe was, was, was fantastic. And then same thing when I ended up coming back here to play, traveling all across the country to go and do something that you love. It's like anything that was coming after that, I had already done what I love. So everything else was going to be a step down a little bit. So, uh, just, just trying to find those, those areas um that i enjoyed in the football life now in the insurance world and there's a lot of similarities you know the 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 teamwork the competitiveness Mm -hmm. and trying to translate that i think has been super useful and would be super useful in any industry yeah yeah i um i remember listening to a former i want to say his event was um a relay race he was a former olympian that ended up in the insurance industry somehow and his entire keynote was about how he was able to take the principles he had learned as an Olympian, you know, the discipline, uh, the sort of grind uh, day in and day out, the, the competitiveness and, and just tra- and turn them into, you know, you use them in a different form essentially in the industry and sort of that's what catapulted his career. And, um, uh, and you know, it, it's tough, you still have to go go back a little bit but I think the pace at which you can move forward because you've developed those skills is a lot faster than than others so I love it's just so it's interesting it's interesting to hear that you don't hear of many people that go from that level of athleticism uh and and then you know like walk into uh an insurance agency and can crush it it's just it's really cool it's really cool yeah, and it, I mean, it, it is fun as well because I pretty much um, translate everything into football terms, like <laughs> formations. So, like, That's I mean, amazing. you know, you play. So, if we're yes. talking about sales, service, and retention, you know, yes. we're the back four, we're retention. How does that then translate to the people up front who are in sales? That's, you know, like, so yes. what are we doing that can that can help each other? So, there's a lot of football analogies that get thrown out at our monthly meetings for sure. That's amazing. So, does anybody? Did anybody who you're? Uh, I will call it coaching. Um, did anybody who you're coaching not know the difference between football and soccer? Were they like, oh yes, yeah, so a football? We we have a. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's kind of running banter going on consistently. Is it football or is it hand egg? Like, there's only you know one person who touches the ball with a foot. But I love American football as well, and we've got a, a massive sports culture here in the agency, so it's uh, it's good to have a little bit of banter with it. I love it. All right, so talk to me a little bit about coming into the agency. Sounds like did you come in as a, a producer at first, or did you step into that COO role right away? Um, no, so it's really cool the way that I came on. And again, it kind of just goes to that sort of grinding um, background. Like, I mean, Benny didn't have to to give me anything. And he was like, just come try it out, see what happens. So I was just thrown in the deep end from the start at the front desk um, and pretty much just answering the phone. And as you know, every phone call is different in the independent agency world. And it was very, you know, just sort of hands on. And if you can figure it out, figure it out. If you can't, you've got support behind you and you can figure those things out. Um, So I sat in that seat probably for about 10 months and that was probably the most beneficial thing I could have done, all those different things that you come across. Um, And then I sort of transitioned. We were a former nationwide exclusive agency um, Mm -hmm. and Benny had kind of the foresight that things are probably gonna shift so we did start uh, a brokerage division and i sort of headed that up with the new carrier appointments and different opportunities for our clients so i headed that up um and then got a uh, a book to manage on top of that and then from there we were big in the m a space for the last sort of seven years um looking for you know similar agencies similar culture 
is there an agency that um, you know you're either purchasing book size or you're purchasing quality people? Um, and we found both of those in Charleston. So I moved down to Charleston. We purchased three offices in Charleston oh, wow. and sort of helped get those up and running with that team. And then May of last year, moved back to Wilmington, and that's kind of where I find uh, found myself in that CRO seat. So what was it like to transition the agency from that captive world into the independent space? Because that's not an easy transition as I've heard. I mean, I, I have not personally been through a transition like that, but I can imagine going from, you know, working with one carrier where you know the underwriters to then having to pivot and understand different products, build different relationships, you know, manage different, the, the you know, ecosystem of partnerships and where do you place the business uh, and why was that was that tough to, to make that transition I think maybe initially but then if you go back and you're looking through the eyes of somebody who's sitting in a account manager seat or a service seat at times there weren't options to provide it was kind of like hey this is what we have mm. we can't really do anything else mm -hmm. so being able to then provide those other options, especially on the coast, it is massive. Mm. Like we need to have these other options, otherwise mm. we just won't have a client base where we can build these valued relationships and ultimately we won't have a business. So by necessity, I think people got on board really quickly and we started creating those quality relationships with some of the regional carriers and the regional carriers were very, um, helpful coming in and always open, you know, always available for communication. So I think initially it was kind of scary, but sort of anything that's of benefit maybe is at the start. And since then, we've just been, I mean, one of our major core values at the agency is agility. You know, what we're doing today might not be what we're doing tomorrow. So how do we pivot? Yep. And we're continuing to do that now because it's such a hard insurance market, mm. and, you know, across the country, especially here mm -hmm. in the Carolinas. Mm -hmm. What about the technology side? Did Nationwide have a, like a proprietary system that you guys were using and then once you decided to make that transition, you kind of had to figure it out or were you, was the tech the same? How did that work? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. It's actually great timing as well because I joined pretty much six months after we jumped on Kiki Catalyst. So oh, previously okay. Nationwide did have um, their own system and everything was done in Nationwide, even to the point where you could add like a shell policy that mm -hmm. was broker business. Mm -hmm. So you couldn't really do anything with it, but at least in that one system, you knew where it was. Mm -hmm. um, but obviously with the expansion and, you know, getting regional carriers, we needed something better to be able to, to, to move quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's where QQ Catalyst came on. And admittedly, probably when we started QQ Catalyst, we didn't, not that we didn't know what we were getting into it, but we probably didn't organize it and utilize it the way that it it could have been at the start. Mm -hmm. So that's been a massive initiative for us in the last year is, you know, you know, junk data in, junk data out, like making sure that everything's as accurate as it possibly can be. Mm -hmm. So we can be as efficient as we possibly can be. Yeah, I was, if you wouldn't mind explaining more what you mean by that, because it, it set up of a system could mean a lot of different things, right? It could be training, it could be just the, if there's any customization needed in the system, it could be uh, the processes around this and how the system is used and, you know, whether people are actually following those processes. So what, when, you know, when you say that like first, first run at QQ, you wish you would have done it better. What, what, what does that actually mean? Um, so I think the, the, the way that QQ is viewed, just because, again, nationwide exclusive agent, and we got people that have been here for, you know, 20, 25 years, mm -hmm. it was really just a library and a starting point to mm -hmm. be able to then go and do any action items that needed to be addressed. Mm -hmm. So it was pretty much the whole book of business was put in as, you know, William Sheely as the agent, William Sheely as the CSR. It's just in there in the system. Ah, but then okay. 
with the way that our agency makeup was, I mean, we had to figure out, you know, how are we going to then work it because it's not assigned to you like the way it was in Nationwide. So mm -hmm. we started doing alpha splits for account managers mm -hmm. and rather than, you know, code the CSR as the account manager in QQ, mm -hmm. we would just pull the report. We had a macro running on Excel and that's where people would work from. Mm -hmm. So it was, from the start, if we had done it where the account managers were listed correctly, given that the current book of business that you have is your biggest revenue source, I think that would have helped us utilize some of the tools quicker in QQ that we're utilizing mm. utilizing today. Mm. And it sounds like maybe that first swing with QQ and it not going as well as you guys had hoped pushed you out into the market to say, all right, well, what else is out there? You know, we want to kind of see what's what's going on. And then actually ended up coming full circle back to is it qq specifically or were you, were you guys considering other uh like an ams 360 or something in addition uh, in no no so i mean we love qq from the start don't get me wrong I'm, obviously you can always improve something yep. um yep. but the efficiencies that we had in qq and it would have been summer of last year where we've got all our smart flows we've got all our you know automated emails going out renewal reminders the text functions um you know sales room all those were up and humming you know really really well and then as an agency we were very fortunate that we were able to partner with a private equity firm and understanding from a high level that you know they'd like all the data in a, in a certain way so they can judge trends, they can mm -hmm. go to carriers and talk about commission agreements, this, mm -hmm. that, and the other. Mm -hmm. So there's a big push to get everybody on the same system. And us being a agency that's always trying to be on the forefront and is agile, um, we were like, yeah, let's do it, let's go. And we went to, we went to that new management system and it became apparent that because we're, you know, a personal lines heavy agency, mm -hmm. that the data pieces that they were looking for kind of nullified our efficiencies. Mm -hmm. And it was like, okay, this is what we're doing currently in the Kiki Catalyst system. We can't move that quick mm -hmm. in this new system. Mm -hmm. And there's extra steps on items for our service folks and our account managers that are kind of hampering the relationship with the with the with the clients mm -hmm. so does this make sense for us mm -hmm. and it wasn't i mean the decision to go wasn't taken lightly and the decision to come back wasn't taken lightly mm. it was a true sort of two-month gap analysis of this is what we had mm -hmm. this is where we're at now mm -hmm. and we just think it's going to be more beneficial to be where we were previously. Yep. Um, so it was the right decision to go and it was the right decision to come back because in going, it highlighted some of those things that we needed to improve on. And that has been a massive focus since the start of the year. And, and fortunately enough, we have a very sort of broad thinking private equity firm that, that we're in with and they completely understood and were completely supportive. And you know, you know what, maybe there is a couple of different ways to, to get this thing done go and go back to QQ and make it the best possible version that you can for your agency. So that's kind of where we're at today. That's fantastic. Yeah, I've been in the insurance industry since, uh, I guess you could say I was born because my dad is an insurance agent. Um, and I'll say when you walk into an independent tech stack, if you see one, you've, you've really seen one. Everybody does it a little differently and you've got to find the right fit for you. There is no you know, best out there. It's, it just depends on the model that you've created uh, and, and what your needs are. So I love to hear that QQ is working for you guys. Um, one of the things that, and we hadn't talked about it uh, personally, but I had heard through the grapevine that there was a process that you guys were specifically tracking and you were able to get it uh, down through, through QQ by a, a, a number of minutes. Um, and so, you know, you saved a lot of time essentially in the QQ system. Would you, would you be willing to kind of talk through what, what that process or workflow is in QQ and how you've integrated different pieces to save your, your team some time? Um, well, I'm not entirely sure what process that might be, I, but in going... Yeah, I want to say it was uh, between the phones, the VoIP solution and, uh, okay. and, the, and QQ. Yeah, from taking the phone call to like starting the service request. 
there was a number of minutes gotcha. saved. Yeah, and so as part of that sort of gap analysis um, piece, we did, I mean, we just, basically we just went through five different workflows that are the most consi- the most common workflows that we have from a service side and account management side. And we have the Lightspeed phone system, which mm-hmm. has a great integration with Kiki Catalyst. If Sydney Rowe calls me and her, she's calling me from a phone number that is in QQ, your window is going to pop up in QQ immediately, mm. which is a massive value add. It's a small thing, but it's a massive value add because when I answer the phone, I can say, oh, hey, Sid, how's it going? Did you watch the game last night? Like, did Megan Rapino school? Where <laughs> if you don't have that small thing, you're like, oh, hey, who's this? How do you spell your last name? What's your address? So it does save a lot of time on that piece. And then also just building the value of the relationship every time you have communication with a client is is super important. Um, So, I mean, it cuts down, you know, it cuts down any initial action item that you have just having that, that, that um, extra window pop up. Um, And that translates to any action item that you have, you know, from then on. So our service team was really, the ones who are hurting the most from not having that going to the new system. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, they're taking hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of calls a month. Mm. So that was a big piece for sure. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, When what maybe we step back for a second, talk about the the tech stack that you guys have built out. So, you, you, you know, you have QQ as your AMS, but I think a lot of agencies out there still believe that, you know, the agency management system is uh all you need to become a digital agency um and you don't really need much more than that i mean maybe you need a raider Uh, and today we have this you know i call it like the crm war uh there's this sort of like battle between the crm and ams and how do they work together and where do where do people sit the most um and and then you've got other tools that come in like the VoIP, uh, like e-signature or e-pay solutions and different things, and all of those work together and when integrated properly, uh, actually make uh, take a lot of manual processes and remove uh, remove the manual and allow you to, to to digitize so and create a better experience for the customer. What uh, what are all the pieces that you guys have put together and how did you how did you figure out what you wanted and, and in what order and, and introduce them to your team? Yeah, so it's it's kind of a two-phase question because prior to the summer of last year when the decision was made to go to the new agency management system, we were really looking to make QQ do, you know, like 80% of the things that we needed if it was possible. Mm. Um, and finding those, you know, integrations or orange partners um, was made a lot easier because we actually had a, uh, in the state, we pretty much had like an aggregator of about 20 different former nationwide exclusive agents that we could bounce ideas off. So having, um, rather than just going to a, a new thing blind, we would find somebody that was already on that that system that was one of those agencies that we've had a lot of dealings with. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're, we were on Formstack sign, um, and we weren't on Lightspeed previously, but we got a demo and then sat in an agency for, for two weeks to see Lightspeed. Yet yeah, we need this for sure. Um, and we had PL Reader previously and we had Agency Zoom, but neither of those were as robust as they are today. Mm. So super excited about, and you know, after being in Austin, talking about the My Personal Line suite, mm. you know, this sort of trifecta of QQ Catalyst, Agency Zoom, and PL Reader. Um, we're really excited to get those back up and running. Um, but it's important that we have everything accurate in QQ to start from. But we're looking to get that um, done by the, by the start of the third quarter, for sure. How do a agency, so you mentioned that you wish you, when you started, you thought the agency management system was going to do 80% of the work. And then you brought in more, more tools, right, to, to kind of take over some of that. How do agency Zoom and, and uh QQ work together? Do you, do you feel like it's a 50-50 split? Um, I mean, I've heard agencies 
where 80% of the work is in agency Zoom and 20% is in QQ. I've, I've also heard the opposite. Um, you know, I think it just depends on your model and where you want people to work and how you want to use automation and what types of uh, intelligence you want to have about the performance of your service side and sales side. So what have you guys found works best for Shealy Insurance? Um, so again, just because of where we were, it was the utilizing every possible, like getting every ounce of juice that we can out of QQ. Mm -hmm. um, and then, okay, we've done that. What are we missing? So it was the sort of lead generation and the pipelines, um, especially from a sales side and like a service ticket side. Mm -hmm. um, really excited about getting those up and running for um, especially the service side, because presently we're, we're basically, I mean, there's things that we can track and we're tracking a lot of, you know, great KPIs, but there, somebody's going in behind and manually doing it where if you're going through the workflows in agency zoom it, it, it's automatic yeah so like that is you know a massive piece that, that that we're looking forward to and again after being in austin just seeing if maybe a salesperson is living 80 percent of their life in agent the work that they're doing and the benefits they're getting sync with qq which will be our you know sort of depository and that's where the information is if we need to go and get it mm -hmm. so that's a massive piece that we're looking forward to the pl rated piece has always kind of been like a sticky point for folks here on the coast just because from a property side not all the regional carriers are on there and given we're a very high volume high transaction um, personalized agency with a lot of great lender referrals and realtor referrals. It was sort of, you know, volume and speed. I know where this risk is going to go. We're going to go direct to the carrier to rate it. It's going to get issued and it's going to go on QQ. But with the additions that PL Rater has made recently, you know, with pulling households and vehicles and, you know, property characteristics, if that's done the first time, you know, for our sales team, when account managers are coming through to renewal or we have these massive non-renewal situations that we have on the coast right now, it's going to make the retention piece a lot easier. Mm -hmm. So those are the two things that we're really looking forward to, to getting up and running again. So let me just step back because you talked about the data side of things and the intelligence side of things. Would you say that, that so there are reports or there's intelligence that you can get out of the agency management system that you can't necessarily get out of agency zoom and then vice versa and to me the split is if i want to see from a high level what my book of business is what my split of book of business is um you know uh what, what where how the split uh how my book splits across different carriers by premium and by revenue i can get that out of my agency management system because at the end of the day it holds the it's the bible of insurance policies right I, I i know the expiration dates i know which carrier was written with i know how much it was you know it, it uh how much the we we paid for that policy or the client paid for it what the commission was so those data points i can get out of the agency management system what i can't necessarily get to out of the ams and you can get a little closer with qq because it does have that sales room component. Um, but for the most part, what I really can't get is performance data. So I can see the outcome with my agency management system. Yep, here's what happened. But I don't know how we got there. Right? I, I don't know what my team did to result in this amount of business with this carrier at, the, at this sequencing or at these time frames. And I think that's where agency zoom kind of comes in and says, hey, if if, uh, you know, on the plus side, if you put, set up these workflows and people are kind of running through them, uh, you'll improve the lives of your people because they don't have to think about what to do next and they don't have to send that email because the system will do it for them. On the back end, it's just collecting all that performance data for you. So now you kind of fill in the picture on how we got to where we are today. Um, would you say that's like a fair representation from a data standpoint on those two systems and kind of how they work together? Yeah, absolutely. And 
like I think this is the biggest piece that maybe gets lost when you talk about tech or you talk about CRMs or you talk about agency management systems is the translation from what you're looking for from the higher level or the owner level to the person that is, you know, doing the day to day stuff. Mm. So you can talk about and pull reports for, hey, we need this much premium with this carrier because we potentially get a contingency bonus. But that doesn't translate to somebody that is, you know, managing a $3 million book of business. Like they're worried about the customers that they have coming up this week or next month. So being able to translate that high level into a granular sort of, okay, hey, Miss Lisa, you have 120 monoline homeowners accounts with Orion this month. This carrier pairs well from an auto side. This translates to, okay, if you call 40 people, mm. how many, so, you, so you're translating from the high level down to an individual's like OKRs. Mm. Like these are the three priorities that you have this quarter. Mm. Do you agree with those? Do you think we should do something different? Yeah, you know what? Actually, I think this would make more sense because we've been getting more joy from that. We've got a better hit ratio. Okay, fantastic. Let's get that set up in your system. So that's right there for you. And I think that that's what we're really looking forward to is the, okay, we know as an agency, everybody says, you know, retention is the most important thing and cross-selling. Well, cross-selling is just such a generic term if you don't put a, a number behind it and mm -hmm. putting a specificity to that number. It's not just, okay, every monoline, it's, all right, monolines with this carrier, you've got 120, go make these 40 phone calls. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And you can actually see the... You know, I think in, in a lot of agencies, they might pull a report out of the AMS and say, okay, let's, here's some monoline accounts. Can we, can we cross sell these? But at the end of the day, you want to see, well, how many phone calls did we make and what time did we make the phone calls? And did we have conversations or were they just calls that we made? How many of those conversations resulted in opportunities by, you know, account manager um, you know, and, and, and you can start to get into, I would say, better conversations. I think the other issue with the data piece is a lot of people think, well, the data will just tell me what to do. And uh, I, I, <laughs> you, at the end of the day, have to make a decision or a choice with the information that's been given to you. Right. If you know you have X amount of monoline accounts, it, the data is not telling you to go cross sell those people you still have to make that decision. It's just telling you what's going on in your business. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I think once you know, what you can do is have better conversations with your team, but you, you gotta be willing to have those conversations too, which is not something that everybody wants to do at the end of the day. Yeah. And, you know, something that we found very useful, um, and again, it's just everybody's kind of got goal setting pieces, you know, from from top down, mm -hmm. but truly empowering your team to be able to make those decisions as well. Mm -hmm. Like, all right, we know we want, you know, a 10% increase in something. Mm -hmm. But how does what you're doing on a day to day contribute to that? Well, I feel like I should be doing this. And you know, if they set those goals themselves, they're more empowered to, you know, to, to achieve those rather than me saying or Benny saying, hey, we need to do this. Mm -hmm. If you've come up with that game plan by yourself and it does kind of filter under what we're trying to do overall from an agency side, mm -hmm. it's just gonna be more beneficial for everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed, agreed. How, so how do you empower them to set those goals for themselves? Is it something that you sit down with your team individually on a weekly basis and you know review certain OKRs and and then sort of allow them through that conversation to to figure it out themselves or are like how, how do, I guess how does that work yeah so um, we have a monthly agency call where it's touching on pretty much every aspect of you know what the game plan is for the call uh, ahead and what we had done previously and then we have a bi-weekly vertical call for each of our verticals which would be sales retention service uh, and marketing and they 
create the OKRs themselves for those verticals. And right now we're just at that stage where we've got the agency level and the vertical level. We're planning to have by the start of Q4 where everybody would have their own individual ones. Um, and we've rolled it out and it's been successful so far. But then we started getting all these non-renewal notices coming through. So it, again, with the agility, we have to pivot. So some of those OKRs that we thought were going to be a priority this quarter, we probably need to kick down the road a little bit mm -hmm. because we've got 4,000 non-renewals. Mm -hmm. So now the OKRs shift and how do we tackle those in these specific areas? And it's been great because, um, again, we're throwing out the here's what needs to be done just so we can, you know, keep being profitable as a business, how does it make sense to get there? And the best ideas are coming from within. They're not coming from a Benny or a, a Miranda, who's our CFO. They're coming from the people who are dealing with them on a day to day. Mm -hmm. um, so those are reviewed, you know, biweekly. And then we, we circle up every month as an agency. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, that's awesome. And how long have you been with the agency? You said six, six years? No. So yeah, it'll be six years, six and a half years. Six and a half years. And it took, how long did it take you to get to, here's why I ask, I think there's a lot of agencies that would love to be at the point that you're at today. Uh, and what I want them to hear is it, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not like you woke up, turned the switch and said, yeah, we've got a, an amazing tech setup that is efficient gives us the insights we need and now we're having the right conversations and setting and pivoting on the right OKRs. How how did that transition happen over time? I'm, I'm assuming it's incremental change. Yeah, I, I think we've been very fortunate and, and a lot of it probably is luck with the, with the folks that we've hired. We have mm -hmm. such a, a fantastic team of folks who it's not just sort of bare minimum. Mm -hmm. You know, they're always going to do that little bit extra. There's another one of our core values is desire to overachieve. But um, the the leadership team has done a fantastic job of hiring people with the, with the sort of right energy and then empowering them with tools to be able to be the best professional versions of themselves and personal versions of themselves if they want to be. Mm -hmm. And then when those, you know, do kind of, take some traction on any sort of initiative that they're working on, there's room for that, you know, continuous evolution. Mm -hmm. So I think that it, 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 it's, I don't know it's cliche, but it's really the people that we've managed to attract and, and, and keep here at the agency by allowing there to be a growth, be growth personally and professionally. Mm -hmm. I think that's that's been a massive benefit. It's mm, amazing. Well, Tom, thank you so much for coming on and sharing the story of Sheely Insurance and everything that you're working on. I appreciate it. Um, and as somebody who's been in the industry for a chunk of time, you know, people like you are leading the next wave of what the independent agency you know, looks like in 2024 and beyond. So thanks for the hard work. I, I know a lot of times it can feel like you're stuck in OKR land, you know, sitting in the office at 6 p.m. at night. And um, it is it's amazing work. So I really appreciate you. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I've been looking forward to it ever since we uh, we had the idea. Awesome. All right. Well, have a wonderful one. And hopefully we'll catch up with you in maybe, a, you know, a couple months or a year or so and see where things are at. Perfect. You take care. Love what you heard? Listen, don't stop here. We know you don't want to. Hit subscribe on your favorite podcast platform or YouTube if you love watching and get notified as soon as new episodes come out weekly. Let's go.